Question for you. Would you like the Lord Jesus Christ to return tonight? If he returned, he'd come to do away with the this kind of sick pandemic world that we're in and create the new heavens and the new earth in which righteousness would dwell. Do you hasten that day because you really want it to come by genuinely, for example, praying the Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come, wanting that to be the case? Or would you like God to kind of stay his hand? Hold, hold up, hold up, don't, don't come yet. I don't want Jesus to return too soon. I've got to finish my university course. I've got to, I've got to marry the love of my life. I've got to buy the house that I've been looking for for so long and that I've got to make a difference in the world and by my fame, by my, by my sport, by my career, by whatever it might be, by my music, by my politics. I've got so much to do. I don't want Jesus to return tonight because there's... There's all these plans that I have. The future is actually written in the past. And the reason why Peter wrote his, his letter, both his letters really, was to remind us to remember what's in the past. In the late 1980s, there was a trilogy of films made called Back to the Future. You may see them being recycled through television these days. They were simple, childish, really sci-fi kind of fun based on the premise that if you went back to the past and changed what happened there, then you would have a, a different present now and a, a different future uh, before you. <laughs> While it's, of course, totally impossible, it, it points out the very significant truth that history is a very important study. If we're to understand ourselves, if we're to understand our, our world, if we understand the present, if we're to understand our present trajectory and career for the future, we need to understand the past, where we've come from, why we do what we do, how we've come to be who we are. And that's why the culture wars in Western uh, countries are often fought over history as people try to redefine our understanding of who we are and why we should or shouldn't do what we are doing and our place in history. So Peter wrote his letters to rem remind us to remember in particular the predictions of the prophets from the past and the commandment of our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, that was given to us by the apostles. That's, that we must understand if we're to understand ourselves now and understand where we're going in the future. These are the very words of God, the, the words of life, which not only give us understanding of the world and ourselves, but also give us the words of eternal life. You might remember yesterday, looking at Psalm 90, we had to look at the world from the perspective of eternity and what we have in our Bible, in our Gospel here, in this message of 2 Peter, is part of eternity, written in black and white on our pages or however you write on digital screens. There it is, the words of eternal life. But Peter has another reason for writing, and that is the scoffers. The scoffers who have arrived and will arrive, and certainly have arrived in our age, following their own sinful desires. The, the, the mockers who dismiss with scorn and derision and, and contempt the claims of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, we have them these days in large numbers here in Australia and I suppose around the world in varying degrees. We have them. We have them in our public media. We have them in our Australian Broadcasting Commission, which is no longer ours but theirs, because they scoff, they laugh at us, believing in an imaginary friend, believing in a, a magic invisible friend, a, a, a sky daddy as they say, believing in the pie baker in the sky. They ridicule the belief in the judgment of God. And so in verses three to six, 
we see the scoffers in their attack upon Christianity and we also see <laughs> Peter's attack of the scoffers. And notice from the beginning, Peter sees their problem as following their own desires. You can't, in the end, separate scoffing from scoffers. From the people who scoff comes scoffing. Without them, there is no scoffing. They're following their own desires. This is, this is the expression of their own choices. They, not simply their scoffing, will be condemned. But their attack will be on the unfulfilled promises of the gospel. So you see it there in verse 4. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue, uh, are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. This attitude of ridicule about the claims of the Bible is so common amongst the new atheists of the 21st century, both in social media and in mainstream media. Christianity is not seen as anything different than Santa Claus and, and the Easter Bunny. In fact, you can make fun of the Bible and of the Lord Jesus Christ and of the promises of God more than you can make fun of the Easter Bunny or Santa Claus. Woe betide the person who publicly makes fun or tells the truth about Santa Claus or the Easter Bunny. For these are the secularist alternatives that Everybody, especially the retailers, love to unite our society around replacing our Lord Jesus Christ at the very times of the year when we're remembering Jesus' incarnation and Jesus' death for us and his resurrection. So we bring in the idols of folly that our society can sell chocolate by. But, but come back to 2 Peter 3 lest I get on a hobby horse and tell you why I wouldn't have anything to do with Santa Claus or the Easter Bunny in church or at home. Let's go back to 2 Peter 3, shall we? Where the content of the scoffing is that the prophecies have not yet come true. Where is the promise of his coming, they ask? Oh, it's just not, it's plainly not true, is it? He said he'd come back and he hasn't come back. He's not returned. He's not gone into heaven. He's not going to return. You poor benighted Christians, endlessly waiting for God -o to appear like in that play. But Peter will have none of this scoffing. And in the next few verses, we see the scoffers attacked by the apostle. Look at verse 5 following there. For they deliberately overlooked this fact that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God and that by means of these the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished but by the same word the heavens and the earth that now exist are stored up for fire being kept until the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. <laughs> what is it that the scoffers forget? What is it that they have overlooked? It's not just creation. It's not just the flood. They overlook and forget the power of God's word. For the creation came into existence because God spoke. His word brought it into existence. And the world was overwhelmed by the flood because God spoke. It was by the word of God that the world was created. It was by the word of God that the world was destroyed. And notice verse 5, they deliberately overlook this fact. Uh, the word fact is a little too strong. It's not there in the Greek text. But they consistently overlook because of their own willfulness is what is being said. They, they miss the power of God in creation and in judgment. It's as if it's hidden from their eyes. It's the old idea that there's none so blind as those who will not see. It's more than they do not see, it's they cannot see. It's the sense that it's hidden from them by their own willfulness. 
we, we always imagine that we can see whatever we want to see. But when we willfully reject something, it's more than that we do not see it. We become unable to see it. It's hidden from us by our own willfulness. People live in their intellectual social bubbles now where they cannot hear and understand anybody who lives in a different bubble. It's like the biased one-eyed referee. He will not see the infringement of the rules of his own team. It's not that he didn't see them. He just can't see them. It's like the jilted lover. They can't see anything good in the one who's left them. It's more than if they don't see it. They willfully refuse to see anything good about them. They become unable, incapable of seeing anything good in them. Uh, watch the American presidential elections. It's, 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 except for the fact it's so important, it's, it's, a, it's a joke, it's a humour. The political, the politicians and their party and the journalists, they only ever see one side. The journalists, you can tell which side they vote by how they write. Read different newspapers, it's like you're reading two different events because they are so committed to their own view that they cannot see any information, any facts, any other view that is available for those not biased, those who are not willfully choosing. And the atheists are the same. It's just the same with them. Yesterday I drew attention to the atheist philosopher Professor Thomas Nagel. In another book than the one I mentioned yesterday, this time a book called The Last Word, he made a very candid confession. I'm reading from him. I'm talking about the fear of religion itself, he writes. I speak from experience being strongly subject to this fear myself. I want atheism to be true and am made uneasy by the fact that some of the most intelligent, well-informed people I know are religious believers. It, it's not, it isn't just that I don't believe in God and naturally hope I, I'm right in my belief. It's that I hope there is no God. I don't want there to be a God. I don't want the universe to be like that. <laughs> it's an extraordinarily candid confession from an intellectual philosopher, a professor at New York University. I mean, he's an atheist because he wants to be an atheist, not because of any evidence that has led him to be an atheist. In fact, he knows some evidence that's against, but he still won't look at it. It makes him feel uncomfortable, but he won't look at it. Notice again, what is hidden from the scoffers? It's not the fact, but an interpretation of the facts. That the world was created and destroyed by the word of God. Oh, I can believe in a big bang. I just can't believe that God created it. If you won't listen to God's word, you won't know or understand the power of God's word. The power to create the world, the power to destroy the world, and now the power to judge the world just as his word has promised. For it's the same word, the same word of God that, that they are scoffing at when they mock the promise of his coming. For look there at verse 7 again. But by the same word the heavens and the earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. It's the same word. This creation that we now live in has been and is being preserved for destruction. It's not permanent. God will in due time destroy it when he comes to destroy the ungodly. The day of judgment, <laughs> it's always been a matter of derision and jocular dismissal and scornful put down by those who in their ungodliness are facing the very destruction of the judgment that they're making fun of.
What a dreadful day when they come to see God face to face. But while there may be terrible outcome for the scoffers, Peter addresses the believers here in the rest of the chapter with two themes, assurance and awaiting. So the believers are assured of the truth of the judgment, verse 8. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfil his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burnt up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. The assurance given to us is firstly that the passage of time is an irrelevance. Secondly, that we know the reason for God's delay. And thirdly, the day will come suddenly and unexpectedly. Let's take them in turn. Firstly, we know that the time is irrelevant because of Psalm 90, which we looked at yesterday. Remember yesterday? We must evaluate time now that we live in the light of eternity for God is from everlasting to everlasting and that is the one so a day is as a thousand years a thousand years is a day to one who is eternal we mortals we we live under the judgment of death and are very conscious of passing away never being able to go back passing away we know that we only have 70 80 years maximum kind of lifespan we mortals are very conscious of a of, of this day, of what I'm going to do today. <laughs> when today, tomorrow, the next day. We're very conscious of our time passing and very distorted in our view of the length of time. We have to be taught to number our days. What is your 70 years, your 80 years going to bring? What is your career? in this lifetime what is your projection for the future when you stand as my age and look down a camera and talk to people what are you going to say about what you have done in your lifetime more importantly when you face God what will you say about the days that he gave you on this earth the Lord's not slow in keeping his promise he just lives in eternity where we should. Secondly, we know that God's patience is providing the time and the opportunity for repentance. For God wants salvation, not condemnation. You see God's patience with sinners in that he didn't end the world on the day that our parents ate of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. On the day you eat of this, you will surely die, and die we have. But he didn't finish the world then. He continued the world so that the seed of the woman would be able to crush the serpent's head. You see the patience of God in the long periods of Old Testament preparation for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The thousand or more years of getting ready for that event. You see God's pa patient passion for salvation in that he sent his son into this world to die for our salvation you see God's patience in waiting for repentance in that he didn't end the world when the Lord Jesus Christ rose from the dead and started the end of the world started the resurrection started the judgment but he held back his hand sending out the apostles to preach to the nations, declaring repentance and forgiveness of sins in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to all nations. God could have finished the world any one of these times, couldn't he? He could have finished it with Adam and Eve. He didn't have to wait for the coming of the Christ. He could have judged this world and destroyed it without saving anybody. But God's 
concern for salvation has meant God's patience in working the plan of salvation. And instead of ending the world with the victory of Jesus, he sends the world, the apostles, to take the commandment of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ to the ends of the world. Thirdly, we know that God's judgment does come suddenly like a thief of the night. Now, I don't want to teach you how to steal. <laughs> you can work it out yourselves. But I'll tell you one thing about stealing. Don't send out visiting cards beforehand. Don't tell them when you're coming. Don't announce it. God will come, but he'll come like a thief when we least expect it. Then there'll be the destructive judgment and everything will be brought out into the open. Everything will be exposed. Now, given God's promise, Christians are awaiting for the salvation and the judgment of God. And so the rest of the chapter tells us about the sort of people that we ought to be as we wait now for this time. We've been assured of it coming. Now, how are we going to await for its arrival there is a series of descriptions for our waiting here. Just keep your eye on them as I, as, as the passage as I mentioned it to you. Verse 12 speaks of the hastening of the day. Uh, verse 13 speaks of waiting for the new heavens and the new earth and righteousness. Verse 14 speaks of us being diligent. Diligent to be found without spot or blemish when the Lord Jesus Christ does come. Uh, verse 17 speaks of being stable, not carried away by every kind of crazy idea of any error of the lawless people of this world. Verse 18 speaks about growing in the grace of, of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. But all these ways of waiting, all these ways which are descriptive of the Christian life now, in this time while we wait for the return of the Lord Jesus, they're all based on the promises, uh, our knowledge of God and his word and his promises. So verse 11, since everything will be destroyed like this, or verse 14, so then dear friends, since you're looking forward to this, or down in verse 17 again, you therefore, beloved, Knowing this beforehand, see, it's what we know that has been promised to us from the past about the future that enables us to live God's way now. But, well, first and foremost, it's based in the past and the scriptures. Secondly, notice that it's not passive waiting that we are involved in. We are to even hasten the day. <laughs> How can you hasten the day? Well, by praying, at least. That's one way you can hasten the day, isn't it? If you pray the Lord's Prayer, hallowed be your name. There's only one day in which God's name is ultimately going to be hallowed. That's the day of judgment. Your kingdom come. What do you think you're praying for if it's not the return of the Lord Jesus Christ? Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We are praying, give us today our bread for tomorrow. The whole Lord's Prayer is about praying for the coming of the day. And I believe in prayer, don't you? Otherwise, why are we praying it? We're hastening the day when we pray the Lord's Prayer. And as we preach to the nations, we're hastening the day. For Jesus told us that the gospel must first go to all the nations. And so as we take the gospel to more nations, we are hastening the day. And we know the reason that God is delaying, the reason he's holding back and he's not hastening the day, is to provide people the opportunity for repentance. So the more we preach repentance and see people being repentant, the more we're removing God's reason for delay. We are to hasten the day. All this requires us, of course, to understand, to understand the times that we're in, to understand the times in which we live. Remember the past, especially the promises of the past, the commandment of our Lord Jesus Christ. Look to the scriptures to understand the present, in other words, that we might live appropriately in this time in which God has given us. But unlike the seemingly negativity of Psalm 90 about life in the present under the judgment of God, here is a much more positive view under the salvation of God 
that we have in Christ Jesus. However, understanding the time creates a tension within us. In one sense, there's no great tension. <laughs> now and for the rest of our time on earth, we're to prepare ourselves for the new creation of righteousness and peace by our diligent and holy, godly living, being diligent to be without spot or blemish and at peace. Yet we do have a tension because of these times, a tension between hastening the day and counting God's patience as salvation. It's a tension of, do I want Jesus to return tonight? Well, yes, of course I want Jesus to return tonight, to welcome us into the new world, freed from sin and pain and suffering, the end of this world and all its troubles and difficulties. Yes, of course I want Jesus to be here tonight, that I might see him face to face and rejoice in him. But no, I don't want him tonight. For I have family members, people I know, people I love, who don't know Jesus. No, no, please delay longer, Lord. Please stay. I, I, I want time to warn them of the gospel, that they may repent, that, that they could find salvation. It's the tension between the clear promise of God to put all things right in the judgment of the new creation and the great patience of God providing every opportunity for people to repent. <laughs> this, my friends, is how the world ends. This is the last times that you and I inhabit in our ever so short 70 or 80 years during the gospel era of human history. This is what our lives are about. This is what we await for in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is why we're still alive and this is why, why, it's why we've even been born. For if God hadn't delayed his hand, my parents wouldn't have had me. My parents wouldn't have been born. The reason we're here, the reason why we're still here, is because God is holding back his hand of judgment to provide opportunity for salvation. For we live in the light of eternity. We live in the knowledge of eternity. We live under the judgment of death. But in Christ Jesus, we live in the hope and certain expectation of eternal life. We live in the age where the gospel is saving people by calling them to repentance. We share in the very work of God. And are you? Am I? Are we going to use these days that God has given the world, that God has given us in order to to live with self-indulgent pleasures? Is that what we think life is about? We haven't understood the gospel. We don't believe in eternal life, if that is the case. Should we not rejoice in the patience of God, that God gives our generation, our family, our friends, our neighbours, our colleagues, the opportunity to repent and find salvation? And should we not rejoice in the patience of God, by proclaiming that salvation, that he provides Jesus' death and resurrection and calling on people to repent. My dear friends, give up your small ambitions. Don't give up your career. No, no, as Christians, you have a career. You have the career of being holy and blameless before God on the last day. Don't give up that career. Any other career you have, you shouldn't, because that is your career if you're a Christian. But give yourself wholly to that work, that work of salvation. Give up your meagre 70 or 80 years. They're not long. They're meagre. Understand it. 
As God looks upon us, we look upon butterflies and we think, gee, they don't live long, do they? We don't either. Give up these meagre 70 or 80 years to the work for which God has given his son. You've already spent a quarter of them, possibly a third of them, just learning how to live in this world. We're some of the slowest animals in all human creatures. We are the slowest. We give up so many years just to learn how to walk and talk and, and read and understand and fit into life. A quarter of your life, a third of your life has gone already. Understand it. Stop wasting time. Stop wasting it. As if you have it forever to decide what you should do or not do. You still need so much before your life will be spent in the service of gospel preaching. A couple of years of, of, a, of, of an apprenticeship with MTS and then some years in theological education. Make sure it's a decent one, a proper one, not one of those Mickey Mouse courses that are being done these days online. I mean, you've got to look for a college. You've got to look for a training program where... The people care for your soul. They care for your relationships. They care for your growth in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, as well as your ability to pass exams and write essays or the like. I'm speaking to a world audience, and I know some of you are living with such economic deprivation that the options and choices for your training are much more limited. But the majority of you are speak I'm speaking to actually live in the Western world where your opportunities are not so limited, where you can invest properly in proper training. It might be a two years in the training of MTS and four years in a theological college that you were involved. That's six years more of your life. You see why you've already wasted 25 of them getting to where you are. There's another six years before you're actually doing the job for the other 30 or 40 years that God may grant you. Get on with it. Stop fiddling around, maybe next year, maybe the year after. If I just got a little bit more money, get to the best college that you can to be trained as thoroughly, personally, as you can. And Australians and Sydney siders, you have no excuse given the wealth and affluence and freedoms that are available to us. You have so far to go in your lives. Make the most of the time, for it is very short. Get going, get going now, for the day of the Lord is one day closer than when I was speaking to you yesterday. So we have here in 2 Peter two things. Remember, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promises. Some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. And bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation. <laughs>